Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A very warm welcome to the last lecture on the course on science, technology and society. In the last lecture, what we are going to do is that we are going to discuss all the lectures in a chronological order, in a, in a thematic order. Okay? we are going to sum up the, the entire course. Okay? I mean week wise and lecture wise also. Okay? All 12 weeks as well as the lecture components which are very much implicit in those respective weeks. Okay? What we did uh, uh, at the outset that we started with the, the interrelationship between science, technology and society okay? uh, and the kind of cognitive and ethical questions which are involved in this interrelationship between science, technology and society. Okay? The lecture 1, it covered a part of cognitive dimensions and the second part was covered in the lecture in the second lecture and the third lecture uh, uh, covered uh, ethical dimensions. Okay? What we did in the first week itself, we started with certain epistemological questions. What does epistemology refer to? Epistemology refers to a body or theory of knowledge. Why is it so? Now, precisely because of the central political philosophical questions which epistemology addresses. That is, what is knowledge, what counts as knowledge, how is knowledge produced and so on. And in, in the epistemological questions, we also discussed what ethics refers to. Ethics refers to a study of nature of conduct. Why is it so? Why is ethics regarded as uh, a study of nature of conduct? precisely because of the central political philosophical questions which ethics addresses. What is good? What is bad? What is right? What is wrong? And so on. And then we discussed the thematic preliminaries of the relationship between science, technology and society. Uh, I mean, what is technology? We discussed technology is the medium through which human beings have been interacting with nature. Uh, when I say nature, it, it includes both natural and social phenomena. Uh, then what is science? Science may be an inquiry, science may be a method, science may be an institution, science may be an ideology, science may be uh, called, science may be known, science may be considered a transition from the world of unknowability to a world of knowability. Okay? I mean, oh, Science is an inquiry into the nature and limits of a particular knowledge that is scientific knowledge. When I say nature of scientific knowledge, I mean the, the scope and ambit of scientific knowledge, uh, but when I say limits of scientific knowledge, I do not by limits, I do not mean limitations. By limits, I mean under what limiting conditions science is practiced or pursued. Okay? We have already discussed this. Uh, and Thereby, uh, we, we try to provide the, the interrelationship between uh, science, technology and society. There are different perspectives on, uh, on this relationship, there are different perspectives on STS, uh, there are different models of STS 
namely the linear model uh, or hierarchical model, uh, secondly uh, the interactionist model and thirdly uh, the embedded model. Okay. We have we have discussed this and uh, uh, what we have we have discussed in the linear and interactionist model that they depict the these two models the linear or hierarchical model and uh, the interactionist model they belong to or they, they come under the internalist characterization of science. Okay. As uh, once uh, Karl Mannheim said all knowledge except scientific knowledge is socially and culturally conditioned. Okay. Whereas, the embedded model suggests that the relationship between science and technology is symbiotic, science and technology are not uh, uh, separate entities, society is not uh, outside the purview of science and technology or science and technology are uh, they do not uh, fall under uh, they do they do not uh, uh, they cannot be isolated uh, while examining uh, this interrelationship rather both science and technology are very much a part of social formation cultural formation political formation economic formation right that's why the embedded model comes under the externalist account of science as david blur uh, said all knowledge including scientific knowledge is socially cost. Okay. Even, uh, even Kuhn said uh, science should be seen in terms of its historical integrity. What Marx said uh, that uh, science what is science? Science is a social creation. Okay. That is why whenever we discuss uh, uh, science and technology or science technology and society, okay, we must examine them. Okay. Uh, uh, not in isolation, but the way they have been embedded uh, 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 historically. Okay. In 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 cognitive dimensions, okay, part one and part two, okay, what we have discussed that uh, we have we have tried to go beyond. We have tried to go beyond. Uh, the embedded model as once Bourdieu said okay, uh, science as a force must go beyond the absolutist idealist conception of the immanent development of science on the one hand and historical relativism of those who consider science to be a uh, purely conventional social construct on the other. I mean when I say absolutist idealist conception of the immanent development of science, I mean the internalist account of science. When I say historical relativism, I mean I refer to the externalist account of science. Okay. Science must go beyond, even, even uh, Hari Babu, uh, uh, he suggested that the distinction between the internal and the external worlds of science is not rigid, but porous. Okay. We must go beyond such extremes. Okay. In, in cognitive dimensions, again we have, we, 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 uh, what we have discussed, I mean uh, to, to challenge such internalist accounts of science, okay, we have discussed technological determinism. What is that technological determinism? Now, technological determinism refers to the idea that technology develops as the sole result of an internal dynamic and then unmediated by any other influence mold society to fit its patterns to fit its patterns okay but what we what we find is that technology is very much a byproduct of social formation okay the neutrality of technology very often uh, uh, um, uh, you will find that uh, people very often say that no, uh, even scholars, intelligence say they say they suggest that no, uh, technology is neutral. Okay, but but the neutrality of a technology very much depends on upon the way it is designed and the way it is controlled. That's how we gave the example of Robert Moss's construction of the New York Bridge. Okay, how uh, the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moss's uh, reflects uh, 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 racial prejudice and class bias 
that is how technology is not neutral. Okay? It is not neutral. Technologies have various political properties, what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic uh, system in which it is embedded. Machines, whenever you talk about technology within within cognitive dimensions we are discussing, okay. uh, whenever you, you talk about machines, uh, structures and systems of modern material culture, okay, they are often examined these, these, these artifacts, machines, structures, systems of modern material culture, technologies, they are often examined in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency, in terms of positive and negative and environmental effects, but the, but the most important thing is that uh, uh, it is very important to examine the way machines, structures, uh, systems of modern material culture, uh, technologies, they embody power and authority. Okay? This is important. That is why we, we discussed Louis Mumford's classification of uh, two technological systems. Uh, one is authoritarian and the other democratic. Authoritarian technology, I mean, what Mumford referred to, uh, the, that uh, that is, uh, authoritarian technology is often system oriented, immensely powerful, but inherently unstable. Whereas democratic technologies are human centered, uh, relatively weak, but resourceful and durable, and hence sustainable. Okay, in in in. And that is why we, we discussed how, how the context of knowledge production uh, um, has been undergoing transition. The, uh, I mean the, the way science and technology they were once considered curiosity driven research, now they have become a part of contract obligations. Uh, once they were considered a part of public resource, now they have become a part of intellectual property. And such cognitive and political changes have significant implications on political economy, labor, agriculture, health, environment and so on. Okay? And, and, and such cognitive and political changes that we see, when I say cognitive, cognitive change in science, I mean the shift occurs from monovalent to polyvalent knowledge, we have already discussed. Okay? I mean uh, how triple helix model. Uh, it supersedes both traditional uh, disciplinary boundaries and uh, mode to knowledge production created in the context of application. I mean, when I talk about triple helix model of uh, uh, innovation, I mean uh, government, university, I mean academia and industry, private R and D institutions, they try to collaborate with each other. Okay, and the political change that I refer to. I mean the shift is towards a uh, fracturing of the authority of nation states with consequent pressures to rethink uh, the forms of democratic governance. Okay? And then in the third lecture, we discussed ethical dimensions. Okay? In ethical dimensions, so far as the relationship between science, technology and society is concerned, we have discussed Mertonian ethos of science, okay? uh, uh, Mertonian ethos of science, uh, uh, imperatives of science, goal of science um, uh, and then we moved on to uh, how, how we have, uh, we have tried to look at Mertonian ethos of science in the present day context also. Okay. And that we discussed when we discussed uh, uh, when we try to dwell upon inequalities in science, which will come uh, uh, in uh, we, we, we have come we have this we have covered in the fifth week. Okay. Now, in, in, in Mertonian ethos of science, then what, what do you mean what do we mean by ethos of science? Now, ethos of science refers to the affect effectively toned complex of values and norms, which is held to be binding on the man of science. And these values, these norms are of often expressed in the form of prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. Okay? 
we have discussed prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. I mean prescriptions uh, you know their uh, norms, their uh, uh, even doctor prescribes right. Mm, uh, when I say proscriptions, they are such norms which is guided, which are guided, which are bound by law, legally bound. Okay? Uh, preferences, you know, ch choices, permissions, I mean uh, it uh, requires somebody to allow. Okay? Mm, uh, the goal of science according to Merton is the extension of certified knowledge, okay, which can be spelt out in terms of its technical methods. What Merton tried to refer to technical methods, I mean empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities, these are often predictions. Okay. The imperatives of science for Merton derive from the goal and the methods. Then what is the goal of science? The imperatives of science if they are derived from the goal as well as the methods, the, the goal of science is the extension of certified knowledge and the methods according to Merton, they include empirically confirmed uh, statements of regularities, be consistent, seek knowledge, certify knowledge uh, and, and they must follow uh, uh, logically consistent statements of regularities. Okay. Then what are for, for Merton, what are the institutional imperatives or ethos of modern science? Now, the ethos of modern science are fourfold for Merton, okay. universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. What does universalism refer to? Universalism refers to, I mean, the acceptance or rejection of a scientific claim should not depend upon uh, the personal or social background of the individual offering that claim. Communism, what we say, uh, what what Merton referred to, that there whatever development of technology that we encounter, we, we witness today uh, must be shared by the community of scientists, should be shared by the collective okay. individualistic orientation of science must be scorned off. Okay. That is why uh, when we talk about communism in science, okay, it uh, acts against the present day intellectual property. When you look at disinterestedness as, as, a, as another ethos of uh, uh, modern science propounded by Martin, I mean science should go beyond interests and ideologies. The practitioner of science must not be bound by any kind of interests or ideology. What does organized skepticism refer to? Organized skepticism refers to the fact that we must temporarily suspend our judgment, we must postpone our judgment until and unless all facts are at hand. Okay? This is a methodological uh, imperative, uh, technical imperative. Um, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Martonian ethos of modern science, okay? this is organized skepticism. Then in the second week, I mean we started with fourth lecture then. Okay. We, we started with uh, uh, the methods of science, I mean uh, uh, science, technology and society methodological dimensions part 1, uh, uh, in this fourth week, uh, I mean in the third week part 2, in the fourth week part 3. Okay. We took, we discussed methodological dimensions, methods of science. Um, in three weeks, in nine lectures. Okay. We started with inductivism and hypothesism, then positivism, then Karl Popper, then Thomas Kuhn, then Popper versus Kuhn and then Paul Farabend. Okay. Then we tried to summarize uh, methods of science. Okay. 
in the in the whole period of three centuries from the 17th to 19th two views stand out prominently as answer to the question i mean the aristotelian question uh, that what is the method of science one was inductivism the other hypothesis inductivism suggests that the method of science is the method of induction whereas hypothesis suggests that no the method of science is not the method of induction but the method of hypothesis inductivism was uh, founded by francis bacon whereas hypothesis was founded by rene descartes perhaps for this reason inductivism is also known as uh, baconian philosophy of science whereas uh, uh, hypothesis is also known as cartesian philosophy of science okay inductivism is rooted in empiricism according to which only those ideas which are traceable to sense experience are legitimate whereas hypothesis is grounded in rationalism according to which a significant portion of human knowledge cannot be traced to and therefore is independent of sense experience inductivism looked at certainty and breadth as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge i mean that means science must aim at knowledge which is definite which is certain on the one hand and on the other broad in the sense that it must encompass more and more of the world we seek to know okay uh, the search for certain or definite knowledge led inductivists to legislate that uh, science must confine itself to observations since it is only our observations that we can be certain in other words science according to inductivists must not make reference to anything unobservable that that the the, the means of realizing knowledge that is broad back on found found in the principle of induction which allows us to go from particular observations to generalizations thus according to inductivists science must aim at arriving at with the help of the principle of induction generalizations which cryptically contain knowledge of indefinite number of a uh, number of as yet unmade observations then what 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 are the processes which inductivists follow now then one must first collect observational data without any recourse to theory without recourse to any theory then one must put forward a tentative generalization which one has to verify and once verified the tentative generalization becomes a law enabling us to go from a limited number of already made generalizations observations then the the aim of science in the inductivist schema is to arrive at laws that is established inductive generalizations which are only cryptic statements reg, uh, of regarding as yet unmade observations by by accumulating such established inductive observations inductivists claimed that we will have at our disposal an enormous amount of observations the totality of which constitutes reality okay then then science according to the inductivist schema thus begins with observations remains at the level of observations and ends with observations if according to inductivists uh, inductiv inductivists the hallmark of scientific knowledge the hallmarks of scientific knowledge are certainty and breadth then according to hypothesis they are novelty and depth that is to say science must aim at knowledge which is new in the sense of being transobservational and deep in the sense of referring to entities underlying the phenomena given to us in observations then science then in the inductivist schema science limits itself to observations whereas in the hypothesis schema knowledge is produced science is produced only when we go beyond observations in in other words whereas inductivists insist that science must remain from beginning to end at the level of observations hypothesis maintain that science begins only when 
uh, it goes beyond observations. Then according to hypothesis genuine science must aim at uh, or rather genuine science must not remain content with generalizations based on observations, but must seek to explain observations in terms of unobservable deeper entities and processes. The term hypothesis in 17th century meant a statement regarding unobservable entities and processes though today by hypothesis we only mean a tentative solution to a problem or hunch. Whereas, there is no place for hypothesis in the inductivist schema, the hypothesists maintain that the aim of science is to generate hypothesis to explain what we observe. The term theory means a statement of a set of statements, uh, the statement about a state set of statements involving at least one theoretical term. Okay? That is what we have discussed a theoretical term for example, electron, proton etcetera unlike an observational term does not designate observable or me measurable. Inductivists and empiricists and empiricists maintain that anything which is exists must be observable. Okay? Hence, inductivists do not admit that theoretical term designates real entities. They contend that theoretical entities are fictitious entities uh, I mean are, are fictitious entities conjured up by us for the purposes of either economic description of observations or prediction. On the other hand or, or rather uh, to, to buttress the argument uh, okay, to strengthen the argument I mean according to inductivists theories are not descriptions of a world uh, of a real world of uh, unobservables. As against this the hypothesists maintain that the theoretical terms designate real entities not given to us in observations and theories are descriptions of a real world of unobservable entities. Therefore, while hypothesists are called realists, inductivists are called anti-realists. Okay? We have discussed this and then we have also discussed the principle of induction, we have discussed Hume, we have uh, discussed Mills. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, principle of induction and then in the uh, in the 20th century okay i mean which begins with the emergence of a school of thought called positivism in the sixth lecture what we we, dis we have discussed positivism uh, and in the seventh lecture we have tried to uh, uh, end positivism there uh, 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 in the second part i mean the first part of positivism, we have discussed uh, how positivism uh, is an extremely well known and till recently very influential theory of science and its method. It is a closely knit set of tenets formulated with an admirable amount of clarity and consistency. Okay? What are the central tenets of positivism? Okay? The central tenets of positivism that we have discussed first methodological I mean that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity because it possesses a method unique to it. Secondly methodological monism that there is only one method common to all there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter that is methodological monism. Thirdly inductivism that the method of science is the method of induction. Fourthly, systematic verifiability that the hallmark of science lies in the fact that all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable. Fifthly, purity, purity and indubitability of observations. Observations are pure, observations are indubitable. Uh, observations cannot be doubted. Uh, it is only through observations that knowledge is produced in the positivistic scheme. Okay. In, in sixthly, there is a unilateral relationship between observation and theory. Observations lead to theory, but theories do not lead to observations. There is a one way relationship in the positivistic scheme. Okay. In the sense that theories are 
observations dependent whereas observations are theory independent okay seventhly we have discussed fact value dichotomy okay that facts that 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 there must be a dichotomy between a fact and value facts do not have uh, uh, any value content or rather facts do not have any value whereas values do not have any uh, uh, factual content that's why i gave you the example that if i say uh, this this is a laptop this is a fact if i say this laptop looks beautiful or ugly then i add value to it okay that's why facts are value neutral whereas values do not have any factual content and we have also discussed how um, um, all explanation which involves uh, i mean we we start with a set of laws then uh, uh, a set of uh, statements describing initial conditions thereby uh, we come to a, a per, we come to conclude come to a con, a con, come to conclude the explanation that we are going to make okay i mean a set of statements describing the phenomenon to be explained that is the conclusion okay and if any any uh, uh, theory any any uh, law which does not follow this procedure okay then uh, it it is uh, considered uh, illegitimate it is considered uh, invalid okay uh, and is subject to deductive nomology okay we have discussed these things how uh, uh, observations presuppose theory uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, theory doesn't presuppose observations okay the, then then um, in the seventh lecture we have we have ended i mean what we have discussed i mean in 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 inductivism there are three steps okay i mean first step refers to observational data without recourse to any theory second step tentative generalization which requires verification and the third step formulation of law in in hypothesis we we uh, one must start with a hypothesis okay the second step step involves the hypothesis to be tested whether right or wrong and if it is wrong then it it must be rejected if it is tested right then it must be accepted that is the conclusion okay in positivism we we start with observation a set of laws a set of statements describing initial conditions and finally a statement describing the phenomenon to be explained okay in the in the we we ended with uh, we we ended positivism there in the third week initial okay in the in the eighth lecture we started with karl pop okay such such positivistic construal of science that methodological methodological monism inductivism systematic verifiability fact value dichotomy purity and indubitability of observations and so on okay such such positivistic construal of science was most systematically attacked by karl popper who provided an alternative image of science his theory of scientific method one has won a lot of admirers both in science and philosophy whereas positivists tried to work out a sophisticated version of the view called inductivism popper sought to resurrect its rival namely hypothesis in what follows we shall consider i mean what what we have discussed his views on the nature of sciences along with his attack on positivistic theory of science okay what he how he followed i mean it might be pointed out that for popper the value of the philosophical interest in scientific knowledge lies in its ability to shed light uh, on the central question of philosophy what is the central question of philosophy for popper now that is the problem of cosmology what is that problem of cosmology 
Now, the problem of understanding the world including ourselves and our knowledge of the world as part of the world. And in studying Popper's contribution to our understanding of science, one must bear in mind his general philosophical concerns which alone set in motion guide and lend deep significance to his painstaking work on the nature of science. Okay? The philosophical inquiry into the nature of scientific method according to Popper must confine itself to the manner in which scientific theories are evaluated, I mean whether accepted or rejected. Popper refuses to consider as legitimate the inquiry into the way in which these theories are arrived at. Therefore, according to Popper, philosophy of science must first confine itself to the context of justification and refuse to say anything about the context of discovery. Popper considers the creative process in and through which scientific uh, uh, ideas are generated to be unamendable to any rational explanation. Okay? And secondly, an adequate philosophy of science according to Popper must provide a criterion of demarcation between science and non-science. Like positivists, Popper is convinced of the uniqueness and supremacy of science in the overall scheme of our activities uh, aimed at knowledge acquisition. Hence, both positivists as well as Popper felt the need to, to demarcate science from the rest of knowledge acquisition activities. That is why positivists who were inductivists maintained that uh, the hallmark of scientific knowledge or scientific theories lies in their systematic verifiability. And Popper replaces verifiability by falsifiability. According to Popper, the hallmark of scientific theories lies in their systematic falsifiability. Popper maintains that what distinguishes science from the rest of our knowledge is not that scientific statements are verifiable, but they are falsifiable. The scientific theories are falsifiable according to Popper in the sense that they, they transparently state what circumstances lead to their rejection. Whenever scientific theories are advanced, it is also stated under what conditions they turn out to be false, so that, they, so that we try to obtain those conditions in order to falsify our claims. Then, then what are uh, the, the what, what kind of method that um, no, or what kind of steps that uh, Popper followed? It is the method of hypothetical deductive model, uh, which Popper followed. Uh, uh, I mean, for Popper, for Popper, one must start with the identification of a problem. Okay. Step one. The second step suggests uh, once the problem has been identified, suppose in the context of inductivism, we must one must start with observation. In the context of hypothesis, one must start with a hypothesis. In positivism also, one must start with observation. For Popper, one must start with a problem. Okay? That is why in research, whenever we do research, we always say that one must start with a question. Okay? Then, once the problem is identified, then we must provide a tentative solution to a problem or hunch that is called hypothesis. Then a hypothesis requires to be tested. If it is tested wrong, then it must be refuted. It is subject to refutation. And if it is tested right, then it need not be, it should not be uh, accepted as in the hypothesis schema rather it should be corroborated uh, that is uh, uh, keeping that hypothesis permanently tentative. Okay? In, 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 in the 8th and 9th lectures, we have discussed Karl Popper okay? and under what conditions it must be corroborated, we have already discussed. Okay? In, in the fourth week, in, uh, in, in I mean third section on of methodological dimension third and final section in this course. Okay? I mean we started with Kuhn, then Popper versus Kuhn and then Paul Farabee. Kuhn rather Thomas Kuhn's the structure of scientific revolutions constitutes a turning 
point in the 20th century philosophy of science. For according to Kuhn, the life of every major science passes through two stages which can be characterized as pre-paradigmatic stage and paradigmatic stage. During the pre-paradigmatic period of a science, one finds more than one mode of practicing that science. Thus, there was a time when there were different schools in astronomy which practiced astronomy differently. So, was the case with disciplines like physics, chemistry and biology too. Their situation at that stage of their development was similar to the one which obtains today in the case of creative areas like art, literature, philosophy and even medicine, wherein divergent modes of uh, practicing these disciplines coexist. Whereas, even today we speak of schools of art, schools of literature, schools of philosophy and systems of schools of medicine, we do not speak of schools of uh, astronomy, schools of physics, uh, schools of biology etcetera. This is because according to Kuhn, areas like art, literature, philosophy and medicine did not and perhaps cannot uh, make a transition from pre-paradigmatic stage to a paradigmatic stage. So, what characterizes a science or mature science according to Kuhn, which enters the paradigmatic stage is the disappearance of schools, is the disappearance of those divergences. In other words, the, the transition from the pre-paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage implies the replacement of plurality by uniformity of practice. When, when, when a science reaches the paradigmatic stage, it becomes a mature or science in the present sense of the term. Then what are, what are the steps which Kuhn followed? Science, I mean, uh, I mean progress of science, methods of science. First stage, pre-paradigmatic -pre stage, from pre-paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage, paradigmatic stage to normal science, normal science to anomalies, anomalies to uh, uh, crisis, cr from crisis to new paradigm mediated by a revolutionary science. That is why Kuhn also mm, uh, foregrounded uh, 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 the similarities between a scientific revolution and a political revolution okay, in the structure of scientific revolution. And, in, and then we, we discussed uh, Popper-Kuhn comparisons. Uh, Popper versus Kuhn, some of the radical implications of Kuhn's position can be brought about by juxtaposing his views with those of Popper. The hallmark of science according to Popper is critical thinking. Um, in fact, uh, a science exemplifies critical thinking at its best, since critical thinking considers nothing to be settled uh, and lying beyond all doubt, uh, fundamental disagreements and divergent thinking must in fact do characterize science. As we have as we have discussed according to Kuhn, what constitutes the essence of scientific practice is normal science and we have also seen why normal science is a highly tradition bound activity, an activity made possible by a consensus among the practitioners who share a paradigm. Okay? If, if Popper sees the essence of science uh, 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 is divergent thinking and fundamental disagreements, uh, then Kuhn sees the, the essence of science in convergent thinking and consensus. Okay? Uh, that is why Kuhn also said no, that uh, uh, normal science, what is normal science? It is a traditional, tra it is a tradition bound activity, it is a puzzle solving activity. If normal science is a pro uh, tradition bound activity, then for Kuhn, uh, revolutionary science is a tradition shattering activity. Okay? Uh, a, uh, the, the, uh, if uh, I mean according to Kuhn, the hallmark of science is tradition bound activity. In fact, according to Kuhn, what distinguishes science from the other areas of creative thinking is that whereas in science one finds uh, ins uh, institutional mechanisms of enforcing consensus, the other areas suffer from perpetual uh, disagreements even on fundamentals. Uh, okay? Uh, I mean uh, and secondly, if Popper considers the individual to be the locus of scientific activity, Kuhn bestows the status upon the scientific community. Both positivists as well as Popper looked upon science as, as, the, sum, as the sum total of 
the work of individual scientists working in accordance with a method though positivists and popper fundamentally differed on the characterization of that method as opposed to this individualistic account of scientific enterprise kuhn propounds a collectivistic uh, account of scientific activity okay uh, thirdly popper and kuhn differ fundamentally in their attitude towards the transition from one theory uh, to another in science according to popper we can explain every case of theory change in terms of certain norms uh, which science always adopts and follows meticulously in fact scientific rationality consists in following these norms but kuhn contends that an adequate explanation of theory change must be in terms of the value judgments made by a community while making the choice hence according to kuhn recourse to the so called methodological norms explains nothing uh, this is how we we uh, tried to uh, look at uh, uh, the comparison between popper and kuhn uh, and then we in the 12th lecture we moved on to uh, paul farabend's reflections on the methods of science paul farabend in his classic against method outline of an anarchistic an, an anarchistic theory of knowledge repudiates the very idea of scientific both on grounds of logic and history he calls into question farabend calls into question the time honored belief that there is something called the method of science which distinguished science from the rest of our cognitive activities this traditional view of uh, this traditional view which is called by farabend law and order philosophy of science maintains that there are certain unchanging norms which determine scientific practice though philosophers of science as we have seen starting from uh, inductivists uh, hypothesists positivists popper kuhn and so on they they though they differ in their account of what they consider to be the methods of science all of them maintain that there are at least two conditions which ought to be met with by any theory that is proposed for acceptance these conditions are called consistency condition and correspondence condition according to the consistency condition the new theory must be consistent with the already well established theories whereas according to the correspondence condition the new theory must correspond to the well established facts according to farabend both these conditions are illegitimate in the sense that their acceptance hinders the progress of science by insisting upon the first by insisting upon the Uh, consistency condition the traditional philosophers of science both positivists as well as popperian overlook the fact that the so called well established theories may themselves be faulty and their faulty character might come to surface only if we allow acceptance of the new theory provisionally in other words if a new theory is inconsistent with the existing theories which we believe to be extremely well supported the fault may not be necessarily with may or may not necessarily be with the new theory but with the latter whose serious limitations may become obvious to us only by adopting an alternative theory that is to say by insisting upon the consistency condition we may be thwarting the chances of a very good theory and remain blind to the serious lacuna of the existing theories which we might miss only because we remain confined to these theories however uh, we we may never become aware of these new facts unless we transcend these theories and adapt an alternative uh, just as we cannot become aware of all the defects of our own society unless we look at it from the point of view of another society similarly the correspondence condition too cannot be sustained by insisting upon the correspondence condition the traditional philosophers of science overlook the fact that the new theory might fail to correspond to facts because facts themselves may degenerate to the sense they are interpreted consciously or otherwise in terms of a theory uh, which is itself questionable and whose questionability um, we have not realized since our thinking has been constrained by it given the given given the fact that all observations are theory laden it may be 
that what we consider to be observationally obvious might be absolutely wrong due to the incorrectness of the theory. Hence, Farabend says that a new theory must be allowed to grow even if it goes against well known facts. Okay? It may be mentioned here that of the two conditions, the, the correspondence condition is more primary because the consistency can, condition can be reduced to it. For the con consistency condition says that a new theory must be consistent with existing theories if the latter are supported by facts. In other words, the consistency condition seeks to guarantee that a new theory corresponds with known facts by being consistent with existing theories. By rejecting both consistency as well as correspondence conditions, Farabend advocates that a new theory should not be constrained by the rule that it should first correspond with facts which we already know. In fact, Farabend says that we must make deliberate attempt to develop theories uh, which go counter to the so called well known facts. That is why uh, uh, in a famous statement I mean uh, that this is a famous statement which Farabend made that give me any norm you like I will show that it is violated at certain important phases in the history of science not by oversight or negligence, but consciously and deliberately. Okay. Then what we have done uh, in the twelfth lecture that rejection of consistency as well as correspondence condition okay, uh, becomes primary to the to the way Farabend tried to repudiate the very idea of scientific method. The, the basic thrust of the second, third and fourth week lectures, okay. the, I mean the basic thrust of this whole discussion on methods of science, methodological dimensions is to foreground the various issues which philosophers, historians and sociologists of science are grappling within their attempt to understand the methods of science as a cognitive enterprise. It may be mentioned that, uh, I mean it may be mentioned in this connection that uh, social scientists usually work with some conception of science and its method. Since such a conception very much informs their work, it is necessary that they should free themselves from received notions and naive ideas about science presented by textbooks and deeply entrenched in popular psyche. All that discussion has, uh, all that this discussion has sought to achieve is to hammer the point okay, okay, that the pattern hammer the point that the, uh, that the pattern of scientific theory uh, or the pattern of scientific thinking is too complex to be captured by a catalog of thumb rules pomp, uh, pompously present, presented as the principles of scientific method. Okay. From, from here onward the chapter I mean the uh, challenges to the received notions about science Okay. Uh, from this we, we, we in the fifth week, fifth and sixth week we have discussed inequalities in science, Mortonian uh, reflections on inequalities in science part 1 and part 2. Uh, what we have done? Uh, we have discussed uh, in the fifth week I mean starting with 13th lecture then 14th and 15th lectures. Uh, I mean the Matthew effect in science we have already discussed how the reward and communication systems of science are considered. Then what is that that in the, in the case of Matthew effect that we have discussed I mean the Matthew effect of accumulated advantage described in sociology is a phenomenon sometimes summarized by the adage that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The concept is applicable to matters of uh, fame or status, but may also be applied literally to cumulative advantage of economic capital. The term this Matthew effect in science was this term was coined by uh, sociologist Robert King Martin in 1968 and takes its name from the parable of the talents in the biblical, uh, uh, biblical, uh, biblical uh, gospel of Matthew Martin credited his collaborator uh, uh, Harriet Jackerman as co-author of the concept of the Matthew effect. 
I mean what are these? I mean how inequalities in science are reflected in terms of rewards and recognitions. Okay? I mean psychosocial processes affect the allocation of rewards to scientists for their contributions. This is an allocation which in turn affects the flow of ideas and findings through the communication networks of science. Okay? And such conception is based upon an analysis of the composite of experience reported in Harriet Jackerman's interviews with Nobel laureates in the United States and upon data drawn from the diaries, letters, notebooks, scientific papers and biographies of other scientists. Okay? In, this, in, in this week what we have discussed? We have discussed the reward system in science, the Matthew effect in the reward system the Matthew effect in the communication system okay, and the Matthew effect and the functions of redundancy, then the psychological and, and the social and psychological uh, basis of the Matthew effect and the Matthew effect and allocation of uh, scientific resources. In the sixth week, I mean second part of inequalities in science, we have discussed the cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property in three parts. Okay, in in sixteenth lecture, seventeenth lecture, and eighteenth lecture. Okay. In in the sixth week, we have discussed the second part of inequality in science. Again, the Matthew effect in science. I mean, Mertonian reflection on the Matthew effect in science uh, to capture inequality in science. I mean, the Matthew effect in science. I mean, in terms of or inequalities in science in terms of cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property. In three hours, I mean in, in 16th lecture, in the 17th lecture and in the 18th lecture, we have discussed this. What is this cumulative advantage? Cumulative advantage in science refers to the social processes through which various kinds of opportunities for scientific inquiry as well as the subsequent symbolic and material rewards for the results of that inquiry tend to accumulate for individual practitioners of science as they do also for organizations engaged in scientific work. Cumulative advantage in science directs our attention to the ways in which initial comparative advantages of trained capacity, structural location and available resources make for successive increments of advantage such that the the gaps between the haves and the have nots in science as in other domains in uh, of social life widen until dampened by countervailing forces. Intellectual property in science, I mean uh, in, the, in the section on intellectual property in science, Martin proposed the, sim, uh, proposed the seeming paradox that in science private property is established by having its uh, sus substance freely given to others who might want to make use of it. Certain institutionalized aspects of this intellectual property system chiefly in the form of public acknowledgement of the source of knowledge and information thus freely bestowed on fellow scientists relate to the social and cognitive structures of science in interesting ways that affect uh, the collective advancement of scientific knowledge. Okay? The, the world of science uh, has been uh, designed in such a way, it is like a pyramid, I mean it is like a triangle. Okay? You will find more scientists with a very few rewards and recognitions at the bottom level and at the top you will find a very few scientists with more and more rewards and recognitions. For example, a prize will almost always be awarded to the most senior researcher involved in a project even if all the work has been done was done by a graduate student or a junior scientist. That is why uh, according to Merton and the world is peculiar uh, in this matter of how it gives credit. It tends to give the credit to already famous people. Okay? And and then we have discussed accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young scientists, uh, I mean junior scientists, accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among uh, scientific institutions, organizations. I mean if the what, what uh, Martin tried to 
look at if the processes of accumulating advantage and disadvantage are truly at work, why are there not even greater inequalities than have been found to obtain. Then, the, then he went on to uh, uh, discuss countervailing processes and then he looked at the symbolism of intellectual property in science. Uh, we have already discussed this and uh, then what we have done? We have discussed technology as knowledge. Okay. To start with, we, we started with Max Weber uh, reflections on technology as knowledge in the seventh week, I mean in lecture number 19, uh, how Weberian reflection on uh, the process of knowledge production. Uh, as a composite product of uh, uh, or, or rather uh, the way Weber tried to uh, reflect on knowledge production uh, is an, uh, involves uh, an interpretative method. Uh, that interpretative method is a reconciliation between two approaches uh, namely positivism we, uh, we already know. Uh, and neo Kantianism. Okay. Uh, and Weber all we have also discussed in Weber different types of social action namely traditional social action, affective or emotive social action, value rational social action and goal rational social action. We have also discussed structure of authority in Weber's schema, legal authority I mean ideal typical bureaucracy, traditional authority and, uh, and uh, um, charismatic authority. And then we have done a preliminary exercise and explanation uh, uh, so far as inequalities in science is concerned and technology as knowledge. Uh, uh, before we moved on to uh, Edwin Leighton Jr.'s reflection on technology as knowledge. Okay. In the eighth week, we have discussed the social shaping of technology. Uh, uh, part 1, I mean social shaping of technology has been discussed in three over a period of 3 weeks over a period of 9 lectures. We started with Langdon Wiener, then we, disc then we have discussed Donald uh, uh, McKenzie and uh, U D Walkman and then Thomas Edison uh, and then we have discussed many many authors uh, reflections may be Marx's reflections may be Bar Braverman's reflections. Uh, on capitalism, class, gender, city, machine, workplace and so on. Uh, uh, these three weeks uh, we, we have discussed technology and uh, social shaping of technology, we have discussed technology and politics, uh, uh, then we have discussed technical arrangements as forms of order, uh, then we have discussed how uh, technologies are inherently political, uh, I mean inherently political technologies. Then uh, we have discussed, uh, I mean in uh, as uh, if you go, go a little back to the seventh week, I mean technology as knowledge uh, in uh, I mean uh, we have discussed how things are commonly done or made uh, uh, and what things are done or made. I mean this is also a part of social construction of technological systems. Uh, then uh, we have discussed uh, McKenzie and uh, Walkman, uh, Edison's electric light, electric bulb, uh, uh, I mean ability to design, ability to control, uh, limitations of Hall's theory of science technology relation, Coer's position. Uh, in in uh, in uh, Edison and electric light, we have discussed history of ideas and the pro and the study of problem solving. Okay, uh, entrepre I mean uh, how Edison was not simply an entrepreneur, but uh, I mean not simply as an uh, uh, he was not simply an inventor, but also he may be called an inventor entrepreneur. Uh, how technological determinism as a theory of society. Uh, then hard and soft technological determinism as a theory of society, 
uh, then technological determinism as a theory of technology. We have disc we have in, in McKenzie and Walkman's reflections we have discussed does science shape technology, then technological shaping of technology and then economic shaping of technology and we have then therefore, economic shaping is social shaping. Then we have discussed the relationship between the uh, between technology and the state, state and military technology theorizing the technology society relationship. We have also discussed uh, the social construction of technological systems um, as propounded by uh, uh, Biker and Pinch, then actor network theory by Latour and his colleagues, then feminism and technology, I mean gender and technology, ethnicity and technology, uh, Haraway's reflection on cybernetic organism. Uh, uh, then uh, Marx's reflections on uh, technology as a byproduct of uh, the present mode of production, I mean capitalism, uh, uh, and how class relations uh, <coughs> are mediated by that, by, by technology, I mean the machine versus the worker. Then technology and capitalist control by uh, Harry Braverman, I mean. Uh, how Braverman, uh, Braverman's reflections on labor and monopoly capital uh, uh, is very important uh, are very important on uh, important uh, uh, so far as the social shaping of technology is concerned. Uh, then we have also discussed the, the, the case of uh, the smart a smart house that is a gendered socio technical construction okay? I mean how innovation can be generated uh, can be a gendered process how the smart house can be a gendered socio technical construction, what kind of household activities are the new artifacts or, uh, or appliances meant for and what material appliances are in the making. Okay. We have also discussed smart house prototypes, the Honeywell house, the NAHB house, uh, smart house, uh, Janadu and so on and what do designers have in mind. Okay. Designers often keep uh, energy, safety, communication, entertainment, environment and so on in mind while, uh, while going ahead with smart house construction. But where is the house, housework? Okay. Housework perhaps is out of sight and out of mind when we talk about uh, uh, technology that is why it is very important to discuss social shaping of technology. Women as a social group th as the, though they are relevant, they are a socially relevant group, but they remain absent. Uh, in the construction of this. Okay. That is why the smart house is often uh, considered a masculine construct. Uh, that is why we, we have already discussed uh, the decline the, there must I mean that one size fits all paradigm um, uh, must go and, uh, and uh, we have also discussed uh, a history of contraceptive technologies, the institutionalization of women as the other there is a, there must there is a shift in focus from uh, similarities to differences the institutionalization of women as the other i mean the development of the first uh, physiological means of contraception uh, focused exclusively on women uh, and uh, whether uh, whether we have to or we have to modify this is what we want to interrogate that uh, modify technology to fit our people. In then we moved on to uh, on information society. We we uh, witness many 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 emerging technology. in the form of nanotechnology and so on, but for our for, for only information technology. Okay. As propounded by Alvin Toffler, Daniel Bell, then information technology and the and and the or the Marxist notion of class 
conceptualized. Okay, in Toffler, we have is characterized by agricultural society. The third wave is characterized by. Okay, then what are the six? Toffler's third wave that we have discussed, uh, Max Bell, the information society in the context of post industrial, post industrial society is one where knowledge and the prime source of power and social dynamics. One where technology a post industrial society is one manufacturing, and we have we have discussed information society. I mean, the professional scientific and technical groups, a new information is being treated as a commodity central variables of the economy and the end of or, or laser society. Technology um, is uh, uh, this is product products and work. De replaces labor as the source of added value created and retrieved ok I mean knowledge is ok nature of work and occupation we have discussed the themes and factors of uh, what are uh, uh, information technology suppose ok I mean political and global aspects uh, uh, which influence information technology. I mean government factor lecture we have discussed new has Tell us to re Marx's notion of class, what David Lyon are of information technology and re adjacent and reconceptualizes. I mean, when we say uh, a rejection of class, Marx's notion of achieved by technical not social revolution. When we say giving it a wider global scope and tools, there is a need to re class. I mean, does it mean that? Um, No, classes are disappearing. No, there is a need to reconceptualize Marx's no information society is precisely because of the fact that the introduction of new technology realigning classes and And we we also provided a information society. I mean, who wields power in the context of dominant ideologies? Okay. Week we have discussed science and technology in India. Okay. In the thirty fourth lecture.
I mean the process of democratization of scientific knowledge in the Indian context, institutionalization of modern science in colonial India, policies of colonial rule. How science was democratized in India since in 19th century India that we can see. The, the establishment of Hindu college, Delhi college, our scientific society uh, and the Indian association for the cultivation of science. Okay? We have discussed this and, uh, and we have also mentioned categorically that that, that the building of such scientific institutions, whatever Delhi college, Hindu college, uh, Aligarh scientific society, Bihar scientific society, the Indian association for the cultivation of science, the building of such scientific institutions by the cultural elites during the colonial period as a part of the process of democratizing scientific knowledge rather than I mean more so democratizing scientific knowledge. Okay? And such institutions i mean science in india was institutionalized and democratized not because of the colonial government but in spite of the colonial government democratization of science in india as we have discussed is an unfinished task even now as such modern science is being critiqued from the point of view of environment and human rights democratization may be institutionalized in the process of science policy making that should be a broad based democratic transparent and participatory process and in the uh, and when we look at the post colonial science in india we must reflect on science policies in india okay there must be a transition from colonial to post colonial uh, period okay in science policies in india we have discussed chiefly four policies scientific policy resolution of 1958, technology policy statement of 1983, science and technology policy of 2003 and science technology and innovation policy of 2013. While dealing with science and technology policy of 2003 and science technology and innovation policy of 2013, it is important to discuss the, the context of intellectual property rights regime, it is important to discuss the patents trademark which we have discussed and the, the 36th lecture, I mean this lecture we provided a summary of the course. Uh, I am sure uh, all of you will uh, have a fruitful uh, uh, experience. Uh, we, you will enjoy this experience, you will, will have a fruitful useful experience with this course. Uh, if any uh, uh, question is, uh, uh, if there is any question in your mind, any query in your mind, any doubt in your mind, if any disagreement in your mind, uh, uh, you can post them on the NPTEL MOOC portal. Okay? Uh, I'm, uh, I hope we will have and uh, it will also appear in the test, uh, there will be assignments, there will be um, end semester examination, final examination. Uh, I hope everybody performs very well in the course, in the examination. It is not simply examination, if you understand this course, then uh, the entire purpose of uh, uh, delivering such lectures will be fruitful. Uh, I'm, uh, I hope everybody performs very well. Uh, in the course and in life as such. Thank you.